The switched reluctance motor, or SRM, is a type of electric motor that has been around for well over 150 years, but it's never really been a popular type of electric motor to actually use. I mean, there's a pretty good chance that you've never seen one in person. At least I hadn't before making this video. However, due to some recent developments, it now starts to become a little bit more popular. So in today's video, we're going to take a look at what this motor actually is, uh, how it works, and why people might be interested in using it. Now, I happen to have an actual switch reluctance motor uh, right here on my desk that we can take a look at because I've been building this for a little project. So I'm going to move the camera for a bit uh, so we can start by taking a look at this motor. Okay, so this is my homemade switched reluctance motor. Uh, now, what's cool about this particular motor is that it's a very open design, so all of the parts are exposed and you can see exactly uh, what's going on. There is no housing blocking our view, so that makes it perfect for explaining how this works. Now, the motor consists of two main parts, which are, first of all, the stator, which is the part of it that remains stationary, which has a bunch of coils on it, uh, six of them to be precise, and then we've got the rotor, which is the part that can rotate. Uh, now, the interesting thing about this rotor is that it doesn't have any permanent magnets on it. It also doesn't have any coils or induction windings. Uh, it is just a, a completely passive lump of steel, essentially. So, how does this motor work? Well, these six coils on our stator are split up into three pairs of coils, with one pair being uh, a set of coils that are connected in series and are placed on opposite sides of the machine. So, for instance, this coil right here at the top is connected in series with this one uh, down here at the bottom. So now what happens is, if I energize a set of those coils, so let's say these two that we just talked about, um, they're going to generate a magnetic field. And that magnetic field is going to attract parts of our rotor. So in this case, this coil over here is going to attract this part of our rotor. And the same thing is going to happen down here on the other side. Uh, so our rotor is going to move and align itself with that pair of coils like this. Now, a very fancy way of explaining what's going on here is to say that the magnetic reluctance is being minimized. So, essentially, if you were to visualize the magnetic field in this situation, you would see that the magnetic flux goes from this coil, then through this rotor, all the way to the other side, then into the other coil, and then all the way back through the iron that the stator is made of, so forming this complete loop. And the magnetic resistance, or the magnetic reluctance, uh, that the magnetic field has to deal with along the way is uh, is minimal if the rotor is aligned perfectly with those two coils. And things naturally want to align themselves in order to minimize the magnetic reluctance, and therefore the rotor wants to align itself in such a way that it minimizes that, uh, that magnetic reluctance. So that is the very technical way of explaining it. Uh, the simple way of explaining it is to say, well, there's a magnet here, uh, and a piece of iron here, and the piece of iron is attracted by the magnet. Right? Essentially, that is uh, what's happening here. Now then, if we want to continue moving this rotor, we simply turn on the next set of coils. So in this case, we turn on this one over here, and the one on the opposite side, uh, and that way the rotor moves one step further, uh, and so on and so forth. And that way the motor keeps on turning. The direction in which it rotates is determined by the order in which you switch those coils on and off. So we've just seen that the switched reluctance machine itself is actually remarkably simple. But of course the difficult part is driving it, because you can't just take this motor and wire it up directly to a battery or some power source uh, and expect it to just start turning. Of course, you're going to need some kind of controller that will switch these coils on and off at precisely the right moment to keep that motor turning. Now, what this also means is that the controller that you use needs some way of knowing what the position of that rotor is, because it needs to know where that rotor is in order to turn on the next set of coils at exactly the right moment. So the position of the rotor has to be observed in some way. It could be done using 
uh, hall sensors, it could be done using infrared sensors, you could put an encoder on the shaft that measures the angle, uh, you could measure the inductances of your coils and compute the position of the rotor that way, really fancy. Um, there's all sorts of things you can do, right? But somehow the position of the rotor needs to be observed by the controller so that it knows exactly when to switch to the next set of coils. Okay, so now let's say that you have a controller that can do this, right? It can do rapid switching to turn these coils on and off, and it knows the position of the rotor, so it can do it at precisely timed moments. Uh, even then, you've still got some tricky stuff to sort out. Uh, and that, that is what we're going to take a look at right now. So uh, what I've drawn here on this whiteboard uh, is a section of a switched reluctance motor. Uh, now, this might look a little bit different from the motor that we just looked at at the beginning. That is because uh, my switched reluctance motor is an axial flux design, uh, meaning that the rotor and the stator are placed next to each other, uh, whereas most motors that you buy on the market are radial flux motors, meaning that the... Uh, the rotor is inside of the stator. Now, there are some pros and cons to using either an axial or radial flux uh, design, but the working principle is the same. And essentially the reason my motor is axial flux is uh, pretty much because that's easier for me to build. So what I've drawn here uh, is a section of a radial flux uh, machine instead. So first of all, because that is easier to draw in two dimensions, uh, but also because that is the more common type of motor that you might find uh, if you buy a switch reluctance motor. So what we've got here is a, a, a rotor pole uh, moving in this direction, and here we've got one of our stator coils. So let's assume for a moment uh, that in this coil we have a constant electric current. So there is an electric current uh, that doesn't change at all. So if we plot out the electric current uh, versus the time, uh, you just get a, a perfectly straight line like this. Well, that is not a perfectly straight line, but you get the point. It's supposed to be straight. Um, now what happens is, as this rotor pole starts moving in, it gets, you know, it gets attracted by that coil, as we just saw, um, the inductance of that coil is going to change. The inductance is going to increase because there is a big piece of steel uh, approaching that coil. So if you plot out the inductance versus the time, uh, you'll see the inductance rising uh, kind of like that. Now then at some point, the rotor pole is fully aligned with our uh, stator coil. So the, you know, this side of our rotor pole will be pretty much along this line uh, right here. And so at that point, the inductance has reached its maximum value uh, right there. Now then the rotor pole is going to continue on moving past point B, and so now the inductance is going to go back down. So if we look at the inductance again, it's going to go like this. Now that's a reasonably, reasonably symmetrical drawing, right? Now the interesting thing about this change in inductance is that uh, a change in inductance induces a voltage across our coil, and that voltage is proportional to the slope at which the inductance changes. So the more quickly the inductance changes, the higher the voltage. So during this part here, where the inductance rises, we're going to see a voltage being induced across our coil. I'm just drawing that voltage uh, into the same plot. Let's just try to do a little bit neat. You know, there we go. So we start to see a voltage being induced in our coil right there. Now then during this part where the uh, rotor pole is moving away from the coil, the inductance is changing down instead of up. And so now we have a negative slope uh, and therefore we're also going to get a negative voltage across our coil. So the voltage will drop way back down uh, past zero and it'll go negative like this. So what does this mean for the power of the machine? Well, power is equal to voltage times current. So during this part here, uh, we're going to have uh, positive current multiplied by positive voltage. In other words, we're going to have positive power, which makes sense because the uh, rotor pole is being attracted by our stator coil. It's being moved 
uh, towards that stator coil. Uh, so we're putting in mechanical work. Uh, so it makes sense the motor is consuming power, like any other electric motor when it operates. Then, during this part, however, we have a negative voltage multiplied by positive current, so we have negative power. And negative power essentially means the machine is supplying uh, back to the power supply, so it's feeding power back into the power supply. In other words, it is now uh, a generator, which also makes sense, right? Because now the rotor pole is moving away from our stator coil, and the stator coil is trying to hold on to it, it's trying to stop it, it's breaking. Uh, so effectively, the stator coil is absorbing kinetic energy uh, from that rotor. Uh, so it makes sense that it's, it's acting like a generator. So the way you drive this machine to either act as a motor or a generator is by choosing when you turn on this coil. If you turn on the coil during this part, it acts like a motor. If you turn on the coil during this part, it acts like a generator. So if you have a controller that can do both, then you can have, for instance, uh, an electric car with regenerative braking. So when you press the accelerator, you're speeding up. The controller will be operating in this region, acting like a motor. Uh, but then when you let go of the accelerator or you hit the brakes, depending on how it's implemented, uh, the controller will shift to this region and the motor turns into a generator and starts feeding power back into your battery. So now let's say that we're trying to use this as a motor. So we're just going to erase this uh, for a bit. So we're just looking at this part uh, right here. Um, so if we want to use this as a motor, in an ideal situation, what we want is uh, we're going to want to turn on the current right here. So energize the coil like that. And then right here, just like that, we're going to, we're going to want to turn it right back off again uh, as it reaches uh, full alignment. This is the ideal situation. So in this situation, you have a nice flat, uh, constant current. You have a nice constant voltage. So you're also getting a constant power. So you just have perfectly smooth, perfectly constant power uh, throughout this entire power stroke. And that means the motor will rotate perfectly smoothly uh, because of course, when that rotor pole reaches this point, the next phase will take over. And again, that'll also be perfectly smooth. So if you add all of that up, the motor will be turning perfectly smoothly. The reality is going to be a little bit different. So first of all, the inductance. Um, in this motor, something's going to happen called magnetic saturation. And what that's going to do is it's going to make your induction, inductance change Damn it, words. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make the change of inductance non-linear. So instead of going up in a nice straight line at a, a constant uh, rate of change, it's going to be kind of like this. Right? It's going to have kind of curvature to it. So the rate of change of inductance isn't constant. Therefore, your voltage that's going to get induced there is also not going to be a nice, flat, uh, continuous voltage. It's going to be some kind of bumpy shape. But that's not the only part of it. Another thing that's going to happen is you can't just turn on the coil like this and turn it right back off like that. Because if you've ever you know, dealt with coils before, you know that it takes some time for the, electric, for, the, for the electric current to rise, and it takes some time for the electric current to decay uh, back down to zero. So in reality, what you're going to have to do is turn on your current a little bit early to allow for it to rise up to its uh, full value like this, and you're also going to have to turn it off a little bit early uh, to allow for it to fall back down to zero uh, before you reach that point. Because if you, if you leave it on for too long, it takes too long for it to fall back down to zero and you end up slowing the motor down again, which of course you don't want. So your current is also going to be some kind of bumpy shape uh, like this. And to make matters even more complicated, the changing electric current is then also once again going to affect the induced voltage. Um, and so you're now going to have a sort of bumpy induced voltage, also a sort of bumpy uh, electric current. And so your power output is not going to be a nice continuous uh, flat uh, number, but instead it's also going to be sort of a bump uh, kind of like that. And so your power throughout this power stroke isn't flat and constant, but rather it changes quite dramatically. So the power output of your motor changes a lot within one of these 
power strokes. And as a result, the power of the machine goes up and down a number of times within one single rotation of the motor. Um, and that is something that is usually referred to uh, as torque ripple. And uh, torque ripple is bad because anything mechanical that you might end up connecting to this motor, like uh, some kind of gearbox for instance, is not going to like those vibrations. And not only is it bad for the mechanical parts, it also produces a lot of noise, so the motor is uh, very loud. Uh, now there's a lot of research going into minimizing the torque ripple of switched reluctance motors. If you go on the internet you'll find tons of papers uh, that explain different ways that you can try and do this, either by changing the shape of the rotor poles or the stator poles, uh, or by altering the way of driving the motors. You're trying to craft a certain drive waveform uh, to drive these coils with that minimizes the torque ripple. Now, finally, why would you want to use a motor like this? Well, what's good about a switch reluctance motor is that it can reach the same level of efficiency that you could get with a permanent magnet motor, uh, except it can do it with a simpler design that doesn't need any permanent magnets. And as a result, it can be made for a much lower price. However, driving it properly does require some rather specific and sophisticated electronics, especially if you want to minimize that torque ripple uh, that we just talked about. And this is also historically the reason uh, why these haven't been used that much. The, uh, the cost of making the driving circuitry for it would have just made the motor really not worth using. Or, you know, if you go long enough back in history, it would have been impossible to make uh, in the first place. But nowadays, you know, now that permanent magnets are only getting more expensive, and at the same time we do want highly efficient motors, and the electronics that we need to drive something like this are getting cheaper and cheaper and more readily available, uh, all of a sudden a motor like this starts to become a more interesting option. So it is by no means some kind of miracle motor that is now going to be changing the world, uh, but it is another interesting option on the table. So if you are designing something that needs a motor in it, there is another type uh, you might consider using. And hopefully, thanks to watching this video, you know a little bit more about them. So if you did enjoy this video, then maybe consider uh, clicking the like button or maybe even subscribing to this channel. Uh, and all that's left for me to say now is, of course, thank you for watching.